right, guys, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Hollenbeck. I am the uh, Global Vice President of Database and Technology for SAP, running the go-to-market and the solution management for SAP HANA, as well as the rest of the EIM and database assets. So I thought given the talk and that I was here at the Intel booth, we'd actually kind of, and that we're here at TechEd, that we'd actually spend some time getting into what is the difference and the innovations that we've done specifically with Intel that made HANA possible. I think people see the outcome, and we talk a lot about it, the businesses, but like, what is it? Because a lot of people, if you the first time you hear about in memory, at least when I did, I said, well, what's the big deal? Everyone's had like a system global area or a database cache forever. Huff software runs in memory, so that sounds like a bunch of marketing. And then you start to get in there and you start to think, well, and you start to find out how it actually works and how it leverages and was written for memory first instead of disk, which still was like, okay, I get that, but what does that really mean? How does that actually have, how's that going to make things differently and run? and kind of what were the innovations that we did together. And so I thought I'd get into it. And you know, the values that we've seen from doing this though first, which was, could we actually have a system that could be fed in real time with full asset compliance and then still allow you to still do massive analytics on it simultaneously and not have to go and ultimately move to batch loads or having to do sub batches, but really take transactions single and one at a time and at the identical time be doing the rest of the workload. That gets to the OLTP and OLAP as well, slightly different, but getting at the same thought, which had never been done before, because a lot of systems could be tuned to do transactions. I could take that same code with a whole set of different configuration parameters to make it do analytics. Question was, could I have one single instance, not different hardware with different spindle configurations, different size, data block sizes on disk, actually do the exact same single setup of hardware configuration same instance and handle both of these simultaneously, both at maximum speed. What we'd refer to as mixed workload systems. And then ultimately saying, well then also, if I can do, of course we're going to handle structured data, tabular data, relational data if you will, but then also saying, but modern programming requires going way beyond that. How do I deal with going to the full extent unstructured with things like text, semi-structured if you want to call it that with things like graph, which we've just introduced tying into other data types, exposing data over as da document objects over JSON, doing these types of databases, and I'm doing that natively, embracing older languages that are still extremely useful like SQL, but at the same time embracing more modern paradigms like interfacing with the system over JSON using full CRUD capabilities, or even introducing new languages to go after things like, um, well, like graph stuff, in which case there is no standard language. So how do we help define a new language to deal with this highly structured information that has relationships as a first order um, part of the properties? And doing all this on a single system and not having to make trade-offs and saying, well, I'm going to build an index and it'll slow down the system for inserts, but it'll increase the analytics. How can we actually have kind of our cake and eat it too simultaneously? And that was the innovations that we came up with. So. What really enabled this over time was, if you think about it, and we look at how much memory costs, first of all, it's becoming affordable. It's crazy if you actually do the math and you go back, and the numbers vary a little bit, but pretty much $10,000 a megabyte, which we sort of crack up as your standard, you know, little tiny Surface has 64 gigs now in it. We broke through the dollar a megabyte back in 2000, and it was trending, you know, just a year ago at less than half a cent. And this is a lot of what's made it possible. But what really on the other side out of the economics was the architectures. And people always laugh and they don't realize that CPU speed actually slowed. They all think it continually went up and we stopped talking about it. And it's the, the race of the CPU of the 1.6 and the 1.8 you know, going up and all of a sudden that stopped and we went to you know, multi-core and quad-core and all of these things. We started talking about cores and then getting the multi-CPU, where you can even buy a home machine now with a, multi, with a two CPU system, um, and every one of those systems can have tons of cores. And, but within that, things got complicated, because code didn't really evolve within the database space. You still take individual users and you go, you get a thread. And you might have a huge number of CPUs, you might have turned on hyper-threading and getting and getting, two th and getting two threads on that first clock cycle, and it doesn't matter if it's one user, they're going to get one of those, even though I have a massively multi-core system. Well, how do we actually leverage that out and modify that system? How do we deal with the fact that now I have a massively NUMA system 
where I have different sets of memory within different proximities of the CPUs and the individual cores, and within those cores I have L3s and L2s and L1s and different layers of caching, and how do I account for that? And the fact that data may need to get, if I want to maximize that parallelization, I want to use all the different CPUs, but now I actually have to go through one CPU to get down to another one based on that new architecture. How do we leverage that? And then do that across nodes. Because if it's going to work in the cloud, it's got to be elastic and it's got to scale up. And this is the issue that we had to address. And this was the work that took over 100 Intel engineers and literally close to 1,000 from SAP and we spent five years putting it together. And there's still 10 full-time engineers from Intel working all the time full-time at SAP working on next-gen architectures. Well, what the outcome was in the most recent, these might be a little old, um, but, but on the last system I had, less data I could get, we had hit the system where on a per core basis, we could process over 3.5 billion scans per second. Now, that's an integer which gets into it because one of the innovations we came up with was all data within HANA is ultimately stored as an integer. I don't care if it's a float. I don't care if it's a character. We use dictionary compression so the dictionary maintains the values and what's actually scanned in the actual data within an actual column is always an integer. An integer math, which we then do is a, only using um, bit level systems, is incredibly fast. So you basically turn it into pablum for the processor. Let's just start off there. And that's what enables these incredible scans. Then you take that and you move that up to, and we could also do, scans are nice. Made for a very cool demo with Wikipedia the other day, and you can see how fast they are. But what I really started is actually doing properties and things on those. Dealing with stuff like aggregates, in which case you can still do 15 million per second per core, but the same system, the same configuration, same hardware, taking over one and a half million inserts per second on an individual node. Um, now I'm getting all the way up to the node level, and uh, as you know, with databases becomes very important. When you're dealing with a regular eight CPU system and you look at these metrics and you start thinking about a 15 core system, that means I can be doing over 600 billion scans per second per node within a system fairly trivially. So how do we get there? Well, that's it, that's the roadmap. <laughs> the first thing is, and I'll get into them a little bit, was we looked at that and we said, let's not look at this from a disk perspective. What is the fastest human way to get data down into a register? Because that's all that matters. If it's not in the register, it's not being computed. So what do we do? And that's cache line aligned. How do we deal with the fact that we have data all over the place in L1s, L2s, L3s, and then in a NUMA architecture across that and deal with the data locality from the optimizer? How do we then also, if we're going to spend all this time compressing data, how do we actually act on that compressed data and make this extremely fast? And then ultimately, if I've got data and I'm going to move data down into a register, I don't want to put one data. Intel's done a fantastic job getting up to 256 bits. Well, let's say I have something that can be encoded in four bits. Why would I waste all that space? Let's pack it up and act on it in parallel, which is using vector processing. So if you've ever seen a documentation for a database, and you know, and that's true for our own disk-based databases like ASC, this is on the graphic that you're going to find out. And they're going to say, pick your block size and format your disk accordingly. And if you're doing OLTP, we recommend 4 to 8K. And if you're doing analytics, we recommend 32 to 128K. Because that's the chunk of data we're going to have to pull down. And then within that, you're going to end up with your table space and then your segments and your extents and your headers and all the data that gets packed in there, and that's the block of data that's going to be moved. And we said that's not going to work if I'm going to do this very quickly, because the problem is this is how it shows up in memory. Until people have started trying to come and compete with HANA, everyone took that off disk, and that's the format this data comes into memory and sits, and I start to manipulate it. So I have all this data that's massively contiguous, rows are all the way across, it's all together, and in order to find anything, I have to go through the header, I have to look at the pointers, I have to hunt through, I might find I have chained blocks, and now I have to keep hunting through all of them to find any relevant information. It wasn't going to work. So we used the row-based approach to all over within the data. And so what we've done was we said, we're going to take the data, and we're going to take the data and only store it by column, and we're going to take that data, and as it comes into memory, we're going to load it up into 64 byte chunks, which is the exact size of a cache line. That's the size that it gets moved through from memory 
down through the L3, the L2, the L1, down into the register, which is effectively pablum. So as you have the actual memory controller, it's in the exact size it wants to move that data through extremely efficiently. So the first thing was by aligning data and cache line aligning it and storing it in a column or format, we got exactly the data we wanted. We actually improved on this in the most recent release because that data is contiguous and uh, they did something very cool, the AVX2 instruction set that now allow us to actually just take the bits we want using the new gather instruction, but we'll get there. So what we've done within the system is now by moving it through, it's gonna move extremely efficiently as opposed to this. The next thing we really need to do, let's build this out, was we needed to deal with data locality. And so within a system, and it's being very simple here for a single CPU, as you notice we have a traditional disk because we had to get the data in memory. But the fact is, is that even at this distance, the distance is, if you roughly follow, Google publishes some good numbers for us to use, everyone kind of agrees on his standards, that to get data out of memory and get it down to core, it's gonna run down to 100 nanoseconds. Isn't it much better if you know about the data and which data has already been cached within the proximity of a core and now I'm down to 15 nanoseconds, which is as far, we can't know where it is below that, but Intel gives us the ability for our optimizer to know where data is cached down to the L3 level. So now we're looking at, I've already spent the time to move the data over here and in a NUMA architecture in which this would be repeated, I may know I've already moved it and spent a lot of money a lot of CPU and cycles to move the data over to get it through from one memory bank through a CPU across the interconnected to another one sitting in its L3. Let's leverage that knowledge to make this system even faster. And so, and then you look at other systems. So when you think about disk and people are talking about in memory and yet what they're really talking about is SSDs, you're 150,000 nanoseconds from this, whereas we're sitting, worst case, at about 100 nanoseconds off, which is the difference when you get to in memory. So now I've got the data very close, I know exactly where it is, I'm able to start to think and parallelize this out, and the data is in a format that it's gonna move through cache line aligned incredibly quickly. Well, the next thing we gotta do is, now that I'm bringing that data through, is why do I decompress the data? One of the things is, this is nice that my data is aligned, but if I can move more data through when I do that movement, the better. So we compress the data as much as possible. Now when you compress data using dictionary compression, kind of your results vary by column, but that's one of the nice things about a columnar database. I don't have to use a lowest common denominator for an entire row, which might have an integer, might have a float, might have a var car and other data. I can use, a, I can use an encoding scheme that is optimized for that data type. And what you end up with, with dictionary encoding, which we then further encode using things like run length and other types of optimizations, is that we can get compression on individual columns. OLTP type data where the cardinality can be fairly high, we end up with a ratio of typically between three to five. In data warehouses and other stuff, where the relatively size of the actual columns compared to the actual number of unique values, that ratio of cardinality, we see ratios between 10 and sometimes more commonly 20 and sometimes as high as 30x compression levels for that individual column. That means as we pull that data through, let's say it's that 30x compression, we're moving 30 times the data through with every one of those fetch instructions to move it back down through that structure. This is where people start getting their brains start going, your system's running faster than the clock speed of the CPU, and the answer is yes it is. And this is because we're using these techniques. One of the things we do within this system is often we don't have to decompress the data. We don't, if we don't have to interrogate the value, we don't need to. And so we're able to go through and take a look at this and actually not decompress the data for joins, filters, projections, and aggregates. And when we do have to do it, we've written special algorithms working with Intel that allow us to do this only using through those kind of L1, L2 caches. So it's happening in the proximity of the core, the decompression, looking at the values, and doing any other operator we need to do, like a greater than or whatever, right within that proximity of that, of that register and the instructions. So it's still incredibly fast, even if we do have to decompress. Well, now I've got the data. I've got a huge amount of data compacting through the system. It's compressed, it's efficient, it's moving through. Now we want to parallelize all the work we do on it simultaneously. And what we do here is using an aspect called vector processing. Um, 
And what this is doing is, if you think about it, in a traditional system, if you took your kind of CS101, I'm gonna take whatever value it is and dump it into a register. I'll take something else, I'll dump it into these two. I add registered X and Y, and in the weird register math, I get X, but I put the value of the sum of whatever I'm doing in, in the next register and I move on, right? Well, what happens within vector processing, this allows us to pack, in this case, a 128-bit register with as many values as possible. And this is where having a very efficient compression scheme so that we use we use fixed length encoding, which makes this extremely efficient. So if I can take a large number of values, I can pack them in like eight bits. I can pack even in, you know, even in a huge amount, 32 bits, I can still get like eight billion unique values if I do in my, if I remember my numbers correctly. But within the system, you can see I can pack values in and then operate on both sets simultaneously to get the answer. So within this, it was previously known as single instruction multi-data. Uh, that, that instruction set has been uh, overtaken by the AVX2. We can increase the throughput tremendously. Just even with 32-bit engineers, you're getting three times the throughput. Imagine when you go to a 256-bit register and you're dealing with a binary, you're actually doing a parallelization of 256 times throughout that system. So some of the cool stuff we've been doing that we had worked on for a while was the work that had come out within the new E7 V2 infrastructure that gave us this new instruction set. The data that was working here, because um, obviously we're doing a lot of bit shifting within here to do things highly efficiently, which is where we got a lot of value here. One very interesting thing was the gather instruction that allows us to reach directly into memory and only pull down those bits down through the system that we need. So we actually can go in with a mask and very effectively get just the data set we need and pull it down through those memories, making the system much faster. So we ended up getting about, not only did we go from 128 bit to a 256 bit register, we got these new instructions. When you look at the graph, this gave us a tremendous throughput, greater than 2x throughput, by upgrading to this new chipset. And then above that, you get many more cores. So we went up from a 10 core, then up to a 15 core. And so you just see how the system starts to scale tremendously. So again, these are some of the early innovations. There's other things we do. There's more work actually happening as we continue to innovate. But these are these things that make it in memory. And why we say in memory first, we've, we've embraced dynamic tiering, which in the next release, the SPS09 release that's due out in late, in late November, early December, that release now embraces disk. But again, it's all done through the system of embracing memory first. That data coming off disks gets turned into this format as it's brought in, unlike a traditional database, to make even those systems coming off disk tremendously fast. So, we're very excited and we thank our partners from Intel from taking this journey with us. It's not over, they are our closest partner. It's a fantastic relationship and I was glad I was able to present. Thank you very much.